So I'm nervous right now, recording in progress, and this is now streaming lively YouTube. My first YouTube live. Actually, uh, actually, I have you know one another accidental streaming during uh, rehearsal actually. Can you see my slide? Uh, you're not in show mode yet. Okay, so, but you 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 now yes. see my slide. Yes. Right. Okay. I, as long as they see this one, that's fine. Because I wanted to just say, I mean, I just want them to aware of the how to ask question. And that's in the slide, basically. So Tony, the live streaming fixed right now? Yes, it is. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, you could chat right now, I mean, don't be shy, I mean. <laughs> We're just waiting for the, right now 10 o'clock, so. I'll give a little bit, one more minute for them to join. And unfortunately, I kind of, you know, I'm waiting for many people uh, finally uh, scheduled, and then that is kind of a little bit late. So I could not properly advertise this event. I mean, so I'm not sure you know, how many people show up, but I hope, I mean, many people show up today. By the way, I think you've got some great presenters today. So you'll get, people will come. Um, and, you know, so thank you again for organizing this. I, I'm looking forward to hearing what uh, Francis and what Albert have to say. Um, Doug and India, I know what you kind of will say. So <laughs> sorry. Excuse me. <laughs> okay, so I probably need to start. Uh, give me one more minute in that way, probably we have more people in. Yeah, this is kind of, uh, in terms of, you know, scheduling, that was many uh, issue, of course, this is, I kind of plan to do this on kind of as openly or, you know, as possible also as global as possible. And then there are many kind of requests in terms of scheduling, you know, can we do more friendly Asian time or more friendly European time? So I can ch change the time multiple time. And then finally we settled down this one and hopefully this one work for everyone, but not necessarily everyone. Um, Basically, you know, and then in Australia, I mean, I, you know, you know, kind of has some complaint about this time, you know, set up and, and then we'll finally, you know, settle down this one. So hopefully everyone just understand the difficulty or issue. And the other thing is, I kind of try to be a fine global optimum. And I realize global optimum does not mean perfect. 
and global theorem means whatever you know the best among all the possible options so hopefully this is kind of global optimum for everyone in the world it's like i'm just impressed uh all the live streaming youtube the connections with the zoom and um we have a high school student that has his own youtube channel we were joking that uh i think he'll he'll you know share share the science much much faster than through our publications so. yeah also some shy people i know heard i mean they will join just through uh, YouTube rather than join Zoom. So probably the audience will be bigger than the current Zoom meeting audience, I believe. So let's start. Uh, okay, I'm very nervous right now. <laughs> okay, so good morning, afternoon, evening, buenos dias, tardes, noches, guten avent, bon sore, Hello all, this is my tremendous pleasure and honor to start this weekly global seminar series with many of my heroes and young people in the audience. The pre preparation period has been my tremendous honor, bliss and excitement with the overwhelming welcoming global community. Although I have envisioned Simvis, the seminar series for 10 years with the inspiration from Jim and U of W chemical engineering department and started this prep alone with no assistance helping me and have slept only four hours a day for two months this global excitement enabled me to move forward and have exchanged miraculously many emails. I mean, 200, uh, 2,400 emails in eight weeks without any fatigue. I still cannot believe it. Partly, I started this seminar series out of feeling guilty. I have declined many talk invitations due to my personal issues for many years. And to catch up, I started to accept all this year, ending up giving 20-ish presentation already and 15 more to come. And then I realized that young people who really need such talk opportunity now especially due to COVID, do not have the such opportunity because the limited conference spots or seminar spots basically cancel, also go to big names and mid-career people like me. Therefore, I decided to start this right now rather than waiting for me becoming a big guy which was my original plan. Helping young scientists and engineers is my number one mission during my miraculous second life, that thankfully given by God, and I will do my best to realize God's calling until I die. Thank all for making this symbio community together Special thanks to Chris Prather and Chris Voik, my academic parents, and India, EBRC, Doug Biomate, and Beverly, was you provost, for their advice and support during this preparation. And then also my wife and daughter, as well as my parents and parents-in-law, especially when I was literally dying for many years, although they, except my wife probably, cannot watch this today, I really thank them. And without them, I, I would not be in this world right now. And Simbis would not exist right now. I, I'm sorry. 
Okay, also you, young people, and your excitement, you are basically making the community and history and the future. And my job is just to set the stage for you. Okay, uh, it's my great you know, honor and pleasure to introduce Francis Arnold, although the introduction would be unnecessary. To give her more time, well, only five minute talk would be owed to her. I will just say that she is my scary role model and my young people caring, lovely academic grandma. I had a chance to give a talk very early in my you know, career after her keynote talk at the first Symbio Seed Conference many years ago. Unfortunately, I was frozen and screwed up my talk because she was listening to mine, although she sat on far from the stage. Well, today I'm relaxed a little bit more because she's sitting far, far, far from my office right now. So my one sentence introduction is, she is co-chair of the President Biden's Council of Advisors on Science and Technology and Nobel Prize winner in chemistry. Please welcome her and thank Francis, all yours. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Moon, for this, this huge honor of opening this SynBio Symposium that's focusing on, on young people. I really think you've given a marvelous gift to the whole community by organizing what I hope will be a decade long event. And warm greetings to all of you synthetic biology practitioners and enthusiasts who are tuning in today. Now, synthetic biology, so named well after I started practicing it, uh, as you well know, aims to make biology engineerable so that we can use the power of biology to solve human problems. And this is exactly what I wanted to do when I started as a graduate student in the early 1980s, at the very beginning of the DNA revolution, right? We were just beginning to cut and paste DNA uh, at the time. And I was inspired then, and, and actually I remain inspired by the truly impressive ways that living systems can extract energy and materials from the environment and convert them into marvelous machines um, and, and, and to build new life from these simple, abundant, renewable resources. Hey, that could be a model for what we need to do. And um, I mean, given that we're going to have to feed and clothe and house and care for 8 billion people soon and possibly 10 billion people without destroying our beautiful planet, uh, I think we have a lot to learn from how biology does it, how biology does chemistry and ever so much more. Now, for me, equally inspiring though, as the products of biology is the process, the engineering process that nature uses and has used to create everything in the biological world. And that process is called evolution. It's a grand diversity generating machine that created all the life we know, starting from our universal common ancestor more than 3 billion years ago. And it's the living world's recipe for adaptation optimization, innovation, and it's just this simple algorithm. You mean basically turn the crank of mutation and natural selection. So of course I was inspired by that process because nature is not only the best chemist, but she's also the best engineer. And evolution is her secret and became mine. So I wanted to engineer nature's catalyst, the enzymes, because nobody knew how to do that to make better ones suited for human purposes. Uh, but as you know, we struggled mightily to do that. And today we still don't know. I mean, this was a long time ago I started this. 
we still don't know how a DNA sequence encodes function well enough to design a new enzyme. So what do you do? You use the process that already is proven to work. And for me, that was evolution. And the rest is history. So these days, I'm spending less time with enzymes, more time thinking about some of the really big problems that we have to solve, inequality, climate change, environmental degradation, dealing with pandemics. And I remain, and I'm even more than ever convinced that synthetic biology can help us here. And so I want to reach out to you young people to encourage you to tackle some of these big problems, these really big problems with your inventions. And I, I hope that you'll not just focus on human health, but the health of the planet. And if leading a research group, I realize this is a very broad audience, if leading a research group doing the cutting edge science is not your thing, there are many other roles for you in synthetic biology and the bigger enterprise because we cannot push the frontiers of science and technology without strong institutions. And I'm so glad that Dr. Teresa Good is with, here, with us here today. And I hope she'll speak to that because we need the government funding agencies that support us, the universities in which we work, the vibrant industry that helps translate our inventions into products that help people. And it's a, it will take a huge community effort of people who appreciate synthetic biology to push that technology forward. So the future is tremendously exciting and I look forward to learning about that future in the presentations. Thank you everyone for this opportunity. Oh, thank you so much, you know, Francis. I mean, this is very inspiring, you know, you know, remark. And then I hope I could give more time, but that uh, I just designed this way. So thank you so much again. So, uh, Okay, so it's my great pleasure again to introduce our next short talk speakers, Teresa and India and Doc together because of the following region. Teresa Good is currently NSF Bio MCB Division Director, and more importantly, was the program, program director who supported Simberg, Symbio Research Center many years ago. And India is the current EBRC director. And that is basically progeny of the Simberg. And Doug is the former director of EBRC, now leading Biomay. I was born in Simberg. When, I, when it was created in 2006. My mom, academic mom is Chris Prather, but unfortunately or fortunately sold only after three years of premature manufacturing process to Chris Boy, even though I had two other options to be sold outside of Simberg to Jim Liao, UCLA at the time, or Georgie Georgiou, UT Austin. Well, two Chris are not related, except for they were both Simberg PIs and names sound similar. So the remaining downstream process continued in Simberg. I am really thankful for being made in Simberg and labeled as a Simberg kid, but I was sold to watch you finally outside of Simberg. Well, I couldn't escape and summoned again to serve as affiliated PI and enjoyed my term until EBRC took over the Simberg. I was very excited to serve you know, with a more leadership role in 2016, but I began to have serious medical issue and suffer for many years. Miraculously, I have been and am being recovered since early this year and returned to EBRC as a council member this fall. So NSF, 
and EBRC are so special to me. And I believe to many young people in this room or you know, basically YouTube channel in the audience, because you may be product of Simberg and NSF, as well as at least Simberg blood in your advisor's mind or collaborators. Therefore, I tremendously thank NSF for my being the product of its broader, huge impact. And let's welcome Teresa, India, and Doug to the virtual podium. Thank you so much. Thank you for that, that introduction. Um, uh, you know, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Teresa Good uh, from the National Science Foundation, and I'm really delighted to be here in this first session of the Synthetic Biology Young Speaker Series and to follow one of my, you know, kind of idols in science, Frances Arnold, who was one of the first biochemical engineers, uh, women biochemical engineers that really, you know, was uh, achieved a, um, really a, a, some, a, a great degree of fame. And it was just, it was inspiring to watch her career and for some of us who followed her to say, I'm not going to achieve that, but I can make an impact. And and I, you know, and I hope that many of you are inspired both by by Professor Arnold and by Albert Hung to see what you can accomplish in the field. Um, you know, it is that uh, men, as you've heard, I was one of the program directors for Sinberg. I wasn't the first, um, but it was a highlight of my career at NSF to be able to be a part of watching the growth of a field. Um, and from its inception and seeing the leaders in the field and seeing the young people go through through that center. It was, you know, I loved being a professor, but it, you just don't have the same kind of impact. And it was just such a rewarding experience for me to watch all of these people really do these remarkable things. Um, and so, so I am delighted to be here um, and, you know, and to contribute in some small way. Uh, NSF has supported the field of synthetic biology from its early days, whether it was support of, we didn't call it synthetic biology yet, but we did support some early work from uh, uh, Frances Arnold. I think that she got her P, uh, PYI um, doing some work, some of her early work in directed evolution, uh, you know, whether it was the interagency metabolic engineering programs and then later more formally through synthetic biology programs. We funded the first iGEM team that drew Andy ran out of a class at MIT um, to the things that we are doing now. And we continue to support synthetic biology through programs throughout NSF, whether that is in the biological sciences or engineering or the mathematical and physical sciences or computer science, um, whether it's programs in my division like systems and synthetic biology or the cellular and biochemical engineering programs in CBET or biomaterials in the division of uh, materials research. And then there are all of the special programs at NSF that supports synthetic biology and engineering biology, the designing materials to revolutionize um, the future, future manufacturing, designing cells beyond the bounds of evolution and enabling discovery through genomics. And we'd like to continue to support community driven efforts, whether they're through education and training through the community college programs at the Advanced Technology Education Program or graduate level programs through the National Research Traineeships or through research coordination networks or support of things like the Engineering Biology Research Consortium. All of these things build the community, uh, practitioners in the field um, and reach diverse audiences. And so I think that all of those things are things I'm really proud that NSF continues to do. Um, I think there'll be even more opportunities in, for the ways that NSF supports the field of synthetic biology and, and related fields and the ways that we might impact pressing societal problems that uh, Dr. Arnold talked about, whether it is climate change or the pandemic or feeding the world sustainably. Um, you know, and some of those hopes for what the field might do might be realized through the new directorate that is envisioned for NSF, the Technology Innovation and Partnerships Directorate. If you haven't been listening to the news or reading carefully the president's budget request to Congress associated with NSF, 
um, and certainly Korea and NSF do, but the rest of you might not, but they've been talking about this new technology innovation and partnerships directorate that will ensure that NSF can deliver impacts to society of the basic research that we support. Um, and that one of the centerpieces of that request to Congress, that budget request, was for these regional innovation accelerators that would help create regional economies via partnerships, partnerships between academia and industry, partnerships between national labs and other agencies, partnerships across all disciplines and across all stakeholders to enable us to translate discoveries, including discoveries in synthetic biology, um, to innovations that make their way to the market and have an impact on society. Um, you could imagine how synthetic biology might fuel some of those impacts, whether it's achieving a circular bioeconomy, a world without waste, feeding the planet sustainably, preventing future uh, pandemics, um, mitigating climate change. Those are just some of the many ways we might, through the power of biology and engineering biology, harness the, that power to solve important societal problems that ensures the investments that NSF and other agencies make in science will yield societal impacts that will benefit all of the population in the, in the United States and hopefully the world. Um, and so, you know, it's a, it's a request to Congress. Congress has to appropriate funds. So all of that is, um, you know, uncertain until uh, Congress approves that, but that we are hopeful within NSF that we will be able to deliver impact of science. And so, you know, as you think about the future, I think there, as, as uh, um, Dr. Arnold said, there are many ways that you can participate in the field. And I think that working together and harnessing the power of biology, I think there are great things that we can do. And so I think I hand over the podium now to India from EBRC. Thank you. Um, I, I just want to say that I'm I'm so honored and delighted to be part of this program to kick off Synthetic Biology Young Speaker Series. And I, I want to um, both thank and congratulate TASOC uh, for, for putting this together. It's such an exciting and, and important series. Um, it's wonderful to hear from Dr. Arnold and, and also to know and with your, your presence at, at the, the White House that um, science matters to this administration and that the evidence and science are a priority and a, and a partner. I also want to thank uh, Dr. Teresa Good and, and NSF um, for their longstanding uh, support of EBRC and their vision and leadership in, in, in growing the field. Um, as the Executive Director of uh, Engineering Biology Research Consortium, I get to to work with these in inspiring members like TASOC, like a lot of you in the, in the audience, um, and, and, and really working at the intersection of academia, industry, and, and government. And our, our mission, and, and, and with all of you, is to advance engineering biology um, to address national and global needs. Um, we, we do that driven by that expertise, the vision, the creative energy of our membership and really working to build a community and advancing the field together. So of course, um, to solve those biggest challenges, um, as, as have been mentioned, whether um, you know, from climate crisis to the pandemic, um, issues in agriculture and food and water security, um, conservation, protecting our planet, and really working to build an equitable bioeconomy, um, we can't do those things. We can't achieve our goals as an organization or as a, as a society um, without the, the support and, and um, ideas of that the innovative thinking and the cutting edge research and technology that's really represented in this series. Um, and so I and, and you are attending. And so I, I really want to take the opportunity to encourage you and the young and investigators and, and all attendees to please check out our website at ebrc.org and to join us as we work to shape the future of engineering biology to build, um, a, to build a better world. Um, and so I want to be really brief because I'm very excited to hear from Doug um, and, and then to, to hear from um, Dr. Kuhn. So um, I, I, again, just want to thank um, TASOC for your work and dedication in supporting young scientists and, and how, uh, again, how honored I am to be, to be part of this. And I want to turn it back over. Um, well, I guess I'll hand it off to Doug.
Thank you. Thanks. Uh, I will be relatively brief because I'm standing between you and the talk, and I am quite interested to hear the to hear the talk myself. Um, you know, just picking up on on where Professor Arnold, Dr. Good, Dr. Barnard, um, you know, have have brought us. You know, my big mission with uh, this field is uh, to advance the technologies from uh, from basic research uh, and have them be as impactful in the world as possible. Um, and so, uh, as India mentioned, uh, I'm Doug Friedman. Uh, I'm currently the CEO of Biomade. Um, I was the inaugural dire uh, executive director of the of the EBRC and, and have recently transitioned that role to, to India. Um, it, as a chemist by training and really picking up on something Dr. Arnold said, uh, I realized um, maybe 10 or 12 years ago that biology is significantly better at chemistry than I was. And so uh, my interest became learning a lot more about that and how leveraging uh, biological systems to engineer opportunities uh, is, is something that, that uh, we can strive for. And, and this group uh, and the talk we're about to hear certainly represents that. Um, it, the thing I think I, I, I would just point out and, and uh, bring uh, to this discussion is that I am very interested right now in figuring out how we can rapidly get from the laboratory uh, out into the market. Because uh, as the previous three speakers pointed out, we face major societal problems, right? Feeding eight to 10 billion people is a big problem. Climate change is a big problem. And these big problems require solutions at a scale that we don't easily comprehend. Um, and I think that biology, as uh, shown by the fact that we live in a biological world, has significant opportunity to uh, address these challenges uh, and mitigate future threats um, in a way that we've only scratched the surface. And so the thing that I'm looking for, that when I come to these talks, uh, when I'm looking out uh, across the US and across the world is to say, what science, technology, engineering can we pull uh, all the way up to have as large of a societal impact as possible? And how can Biomade, the new uh, uh, Bioindustrial Manufacturing Innovation Institute, or EBRC, or any of the large number of uh, organizations uh, around the country uh, and the world, including including governments, what can they do to enable as rapid progress as possible so those changes can go from ideas to making uh, to to making uh, fundamental differences in in the world around us? Uh, I will leave it there uh, and say thank you again to uh, Tesak for the incredible amount of work you put. Put into this and the exciting, uh, exciting speaker list, and I am very much uh, looking forward to the upcoming talk. Thank you so much, all of you. Uh, I this is you know great, inspiring you know remark, and uh, I'm you know, touched. I mean, by all of the remark and the, all the great you know uh, you know advice and anything, everything. So, so okay. So finally. The most important moment is my tremendous pleasure to introduce Albert. He's an assistant professor of chemical and biomolecular engineering at North Carolina State University. His group engineers cellular and molecular platforms to understand how information is stored and assessed in biological systems. Current work includes using human stem cell models to study neuroepigenetic mechanism underlying neurodevelopmental disorders and addiction. Synthetic biology platform to study dynamic information transmission through gene regulation and application of molecular biology to engineer scalable and highly dense DNA-based information storage systems. 
this group's work has been recognized by the NIH, NIDA, Avenir, and ACS Synthetic Biology Young Innovator Awards. He obtained his PhD from UC Berkeley with Dave Shepard and Sanjay Kumar and trained as an NIH NRSA postdoctoral fellow at MIT and Boston University with Jim Collins and Mo Kali. The selection committee basically so impressed by his achievements so far. And this is my great pleasure again, introduce him. So please welcome him and Albert, the butcher podium is all yours now. Thank you so much. Great, um, can you all hear me? Is that yes. Okay? All right, thank you. Um, well, so uh, thank you. First, thank you, Taysok, um, you know, for for the incredible effort and your passion um, organizing this seminar series. Um, I think you know myself and and all the other uh, junior investigators um, uh, are are really appreciative. Um, and also, thank you to all the organizations and and um, you know, NSF and EBRC for. Um, having supported synthetic biology all these years. Um, and of course, thank you to the pioneers for um, paving the way for all of us to be able to you know, do all the um, fun things that we enjoy doing in synthetic biology. Um, so I'll just jump right in. Um, so first, uh, just a quick disclaimer slide. Okay, so, you know, we've been spending a lot of time at home um, with perhaps our furry friends. Um, and so Poppy has been uh, accompanying me and keeping me company uh, through all the lectures and meetings and, um, and grant writing. And, and so I thought I would start uh, this talk by asking the question, how much raw information contained in DNA um, is Poppy here running around with? So one way to quantify this is just looking at how much DNA there is. So the cat genome is about 5 billion ACTs and Gs, and it's actually pretty similar to the human genome. Um, and if you were to assign A to 0, 0, T to 0, 1, so each letter being about two bits of information, um, this would give you something around 1.2 gigabytes per cell. So I can you know, hear Peony, uh, or Poppy now um, meowing that she's way more than uh, just a DVD's worth of information. And she might be right, actually. So if she has 10 trillion cells, um, similar order between human and cat. And so if you multiply that by 1.2 gigabytes, that gives you 12 zettabytes of information um, in, in DNA. And just for some context, all of the world's digital and analog information uh, comprises currently about three zettabytes. So Poppy, one could say, has more than the world's information in her body. I mean, what's more impressive is that we're constantly accessing the information from our genome uh, through gene expression, um, and yet only using energy at a rate of about 100 watts. So this, um, this is just one example to really just illustrate the incredible information density of DNA um, and why many are now interested in harnessing DNA as a potential next generation um, information storage technology. Um, and, and one of the reasons uh, this is, is quite necessary is, is shown in this graph where um, the projected data storage, a demand for data storage technology is um, going to far outseed uh, the, the possible supply um, and this is uh, just, uh, this is actually taken from a white paper written by the DNA Storage Alliance. And so, so um, if you're interested in, in a lot of the rationale and, and projections um, surrounding DNA-based information storage, I would uh, recommend that you check this uh, white paper out. Now, there's also a lot of downstream advantages of DNA data storage. Um, so it is likely to use less energy, material, um, and land and footprint, um, and could largely use organic biological processes. So overall, be friendlier for the environment. We often also don't think about the stability of our uh, data storage media. So even tape drives, flash drives, they actually are not that stable um, and need to be turned over every five to 10 years. Um, DNA, on the other hand, has the potential in the right storage conditions to be quite stable for, for centuries or, or even millennia. And there's many other advantages. Um, one, one is uh, actually, if you wanted to transport a petabyte of information, for example, actually it's currently faster to load servers onto a truck and drive them across the country um, rather than trying to send that data over the internet. 
if you can imagine storing a petabyte of information in an envelope and just FedExing it, um, DNA could, could provide uh, data transfer rates that are, are quite high. Despite all of these, uh, despite all of these um, potential advantages of DNA, uh, DNA's architecture is fundamentally different than what we have in flash drives or electronic storage medium. Um, and, and one of the key features that is different is that DNA storage is inherently diverse, crowded, disordered. Um, and if it's really this crowdedness that underlies DNA's key benefit of density. If you were to try to force analogies of how electronic storage media is uh, organized in its architecture onto DNA, so maybe you want to array DNA onto a substrate um, and, and be able to address data that way, you would, you would basically lose that density advantage. So this crowdedness presents its advantage, but it also poses a central challenge for organizing, accessing, and manipulating data. You can imagine this just because you have so many diverse molecules floating around that have sequences, or sequences that are probably very quite similar. So this is actually a very challenging thermodynamic problem as well. So the vision, our vision um, is that um, perhaps instead of trying to make analogies directly to how storage systems currently work, maybe we should design architectures and functions within our systems that are inspired by molecular biology and biochemistry. As so we have, uh, we have a richness of biomolecular uh, machinery that's been discovered over the past decades, um, you know, half century of knowledge of biochemistry, thermodynamics, um, how molecules interact. Um, so this is really the philosophy um, that we're taking when trying to engineer DNA-based information storage systems. So what do these systems currently look like? Um, this is a, a schematic of a strand of DNA and um, the data is encoded in this data payload region and and no file is, is really gonna be stored on just one strand. And so you actually need multiple strands to comprise each file. And in, in, in order to back out what that order is, you have an index region that will just count, you know, one, two, three, four, five uh, to tell you what order um, each strand is in. And then all strands that comprise a file would have the same address sequences flanking them. Um, and currently these are serving as PCR primer uh, binding sites as well. And so people will use PCR to extract out a um, specific file out of a, a mixture of many other files. So, you know, when you look at this ostensibly, it seems like, okay, this might work. Um, in terms of the number of addresses and how you organize a system, technically, you know, theoretically, you have for every base is four potential uh, letters and then raised to the 20, if you have a 20 nucleotide address. So you get four to the 20 addresses. That seems like a lot. But um, when we started thinking about this project, um, it, which is a, it, it started as a, and, and it's continuing as a really great collaboration with James Tux's um, group in electrical computer engineering and, at NC State. Um, we were able to recruit a couple of really great graduate students, um, Kyle and Kevin, that have really led the charge. Um, and the question that they asked was, well, we know when we do PCRs in the lab, a lot of times they don't work or they give you um, a non-specific product. And so we know that these binding interactions are not perfect. Um, so that's depicted here where a primer might bind, actually be able to bind um, templates that have an increasing number of mismatches or what we call hamming distances. I um, mean, so what Kevin and uh, Kyle did was uh, Kevin made a, a Monte Carlo simulation showed in a dark line and um, Kyle experimentally ran a bunch of PCRs with different um, binding interactions and you just found that indeed, uh, if you, you can actually get productive binding and PCR reactions with templates that have a substantial number of mismatches. Um, and what the implications of this is that if you were to say then that all addresses have to be at least six mismatches apart from each other in order to avoid cross interactions, then that actually reduces the number of unique primers you have to only 30,000. And for a DNA storage system, that's actually quite limiting. If you assume that each file is about two gigabytes um, in size, 30,000 addresses will only give you a system capacity that's around 80 terabytes. And if we're really talking about extreme data storage as an application for, for DNA, that really won't cut it. So how can we potentially um, create an organized file organization system that bypasses this limitation? 
So what we thought was, well, wait, maybe we can just reuse those 30,000 unique DNA addresses in some combinatorial fashion to allow us to access a much larger uh, address space. Um, so that's shown here. Um, so first thing we did was encoded a couple text files and these three image files into DNA strands and um, next gen sequencing showed that they have roughly equal proportion in this initial database. File four and file five were um, encoded in this way where primer A and B were uh, nested in, in one, one order. And then for file five, it was nested in the opposite order. And so if you use, um, you have to use a specific primer A and primer B in order to get file four. So for example, if you run a PCR with primer A first, that will give you the full strand on the top, as well as this truncated strand that no longer has its primer B. And then if you run the subsequent reaction with primer B, that will only give you um, file four. And so you can see that if you do that, um, you get uh, only this file extracted. So by nesting two addresses, that will increase your data, database capacity by five orders of magnitude up to the exabyte level. And by nesting three, that can get you beyond the world's information into the zettabyte level. So, so without actually needing to, um, uh, so, so by this, this allows you really to bypass this thermodynamic uh, limit on the number of addresses that you have. Now, at the same time, um, you know, Kyle was thinking, well, we always think about these non-specific interactions as a bad thing, but maybe if we can control them, we could do something useful with it. Um, so what he did was uh, screened a, about 100 different environmental conditions based on uh, known molecular biology um, kind of principles. And these are just kind of a couple of examples. So if you increase the primer to template ratio, so the primer concentration, you can make interactions more promiscuous and you can get PCRs with uh, templates that have high hamming distance differences. If you increase the temperature, you can make uh, interactions more specific. And this is just illustrated here where you have your uh, file access primer and the gray sphere represents all of the other strands that it can bind and, and access. And so in promiscuous conditions, it'll bind you know, 5, 10, 15 Hamming distance different uh, addresses. And you can also tune that to make the access conditions much more stringent, um, where you access only addresses that are very similar. So what, are, what could this be useful for? The application we thought of was, well, maybe we can execute a function kind of like file preview or quick look um, in computer operating systems. So in this case, we encoded, um, so we encoded um, all the strands, all the pixels that, that give you a pixelated or low resolution thumbnail image of these four images. Um, and at stringent conditions, you would only access the perfect matches and get out your preview. And so you, you don't need to sequence very much because it's not very many strands. And by next gen sequencing, you see that only the perfect uh, matched file address strands are accessed. Then you can encode all the other pixels as well as information for color in strands that have addresses that are partial mismatches. So four Hamming distance mismatches and then use more promiscuous conditions but the same access primer um, to then pull out and access all of, the, uh, all of the strands and therefore get the full um, images. So you can use the system um, to basically swing between preview or, or full file um, access. The same principle could be applied to prioritize frequently access data um, as well as deduplicate data. So uh, memes are just one example of one of those data types where actually most of the information that's in, this, uh, in these images are the same. Um, so perhaps you could encode all of that identical data in, with promiscuous addresses and share that data and those DNA strands amongst multiple files and make uh, storage um, more efficient. Um, so uh, there's, there's some details uh, and a lot of results that I'm kind of skipping over, but Kyle Tomek, who, who led a lot of this work, is going to be giving a talk um, later in the seminar series. And so stay tuned for, for the latest and greatest um, from him. So up to this point, we've really been talking about avoiding cross interactions between addresses, so between these primer uh, sequences. But when you do PCR, you're cycling temperatures, you're denaturing and, and exposing uh, double-stranded DNA. And so these primers can actually bind in the middle of the daily payload regions. Typically how this is uh, addressed is by making sure that the encoding process avoids sequences within the data payload that will clash with uh, addresses. But this inher inherently limits the encoding density uh, quite severely. So overall PCR 
uh, has some issues. It's a destructive process. It requires large temper temperature swings to expose the data payload. Um, so Kevin, uh, Kevin Lin and the group thought, well, in human, in, in natural biological systems, we access information from our genes all the time through the process of gene, ex gene expression. And this is a reusable process. You can repeat it. Um, and it's isothermal, relatively. Um, so what he did was, well, can we mimic this? Um, and he created these hybrid strands with a double-stranded region and a single-stranded overhang. It's around 20 nucleotides as an address. And he could use um, a magnetic bead and oligos um, that would bind and pull out this, uh, a specific file. The other, two, the other files in the system could be returned back to the database. Um, and then this, great, this green region here is a T7 promoter site. And so you can um, add a T7 RNA polymerase and transcribe the data into RNA and then directly sequence that or convert into cDNA and use Illumina. Um, and then the original DNA can be returned back in, to the system. So Kevin has optimized the system and um, uh, showed that he can uh, specifically access different files, do this in a repeated fashion multiple times without losing data. Um, and so, so you can see the, the details um, in, in his publication. I just wanted to touch on a couple uh, features of the system that, that I think are conceptually important. Um, the first is, so, so we call the system Doris. Um, the, the first important kind of concept is that because it's, iso, it's an isothermal process, access primers will not um, be able to access the data payload. It won't be able to bind on specifically. And so you can actually use encodings that are as dense as you want without having to worry about not clashing with the file address. And so what this leads to is you can increase uh, encoding density, and that just leads to an increase in your data capacity without actually needing to synthesize any more DNA. In contrast with PCR, the more complex um, the encoding that you use, that actually starts to cut down the number of file addresses that you can use, and that therefore leads to a plummet in the data capacity that's possible. So this really this approach really allows you to scale um, the systems uh, uh, pretty much arbitrarily. But Kevin also thought, well, um, he looked at the structure and said, well, we have this kind of overhang structure and, and synthetic biologists have used these types of overhangs for a lot of different things, strand displacements, cascades, et cetera. So can we just use it for something useful as well? And, and so what he did was he added uh, these strands that had half, half of it was complementary to the address. And this would block the ability of a file access primer to then access that file. So he called this a lock. Um, and, and so if you lock it and you have no key, you can't access the file. And then if you add a key, that'll bind the toehold, initiate strand displacement, revealing the address again, and then you'll be, you'll be able to access the file again as shown over here. And he can also do things like renaming the file from A to B, A to C, um, et cetera. Okay, so um, if, if there's just one thing uh, that I wanted you to take away from this, this uh, half of the talk, it's really that DNA storage is molecularly crowded and diverse. And it's crowded to the extent and, and diverse to the extent uh, that is well beyond what we're used to in molecular and cell biology. Um, and so there's questions, can we actually scale these uh, systems to, to be functional DNA storage systems? Um, and I hope to have convinced you that I think that these systems truly are scalable if you meet DNA storage on its own terms. You use principles from molecular biology, biochemistry, and not necessarily try to force um, uh, analogies on how we think about conventional electronic storage and architectures. Okay, so I'm going to switch um, gears a little bit. I'm sure a lot of you guys were thinking when, when I was making this uh, claim that that Poppy has 12 zettabytes of information in her, that, well, actually, her 10 trillion cells largely same, share the same DNA sequence. So it's really the same 1.2 gigabytes of information repeated 10 trillion times. So the question really is, how, with just a DVD's worth of DNA, can you give rise to Poppy, who has so many dis uh, distinct cell types and tissues, and, and how can that encode such great cuteness, right? So the key is really in not how many genes there are, but in which genes are turned on and when. I mean, in eukaryotic systems, there are, there are several different uh, systems in place to regulate gene expression, um, but one of the, the major ones is chromatin. Um, and I really like this quote because it, it, it connects this idea of diverse patterns with um, the ability to drive biological complexity. 
So, so what is chromatin? If you look at um, this hand drawing from, from the 1880s, this is actually the first observation of chromatin, you see these string-like structures. Um, and if you, you, you probably think, okay, this is DNA, and indeed it does contain DNA. But if you zoom in on it, it actually is DNA complexed around these nucleosome um, complexes, which are comprised of uh, histone, histone proteins, so an octamer of histone proteins. And these are arrayed across the entire um, eukaryotic genome. And furthermore, these histones, uh, so these nucleosomes can be positions, um, they can slide along the DNA, but they're also chemically modified by an array of different uh, chemical groups. So there's over 60 distinct histone modifications known to date, and I don't expect you to you know, look at all these different um, modifications. It's just really just, just to emphasize the point that there's incredible biochemical diversity um, in chromatin. Now, on top of that, there are hundreds of histone, what do we call writers or erasers? So enzymes catalyze and place these modifications um, and erase those modifications. And these are just, uh, this is just an example, a list of um, enzymes that, that involve methyl transferases or demethylases. And there's also acetyl transferases, ubiquitinases, et cetera. So one of the real big challenges in chromatin biology is this immense biochemical and biomolecular diversity. On top of that, all of those uh, all of that diversity can interact combinatorially and, and through crosstalk and lead to um, uh, something that's even mu much more daunting and diversity is much more daunting. We do have some techniques like cut and tag, chip seek that, that are able to map chromatin modifications across the entire genome, um, but those are largely correlative measurements. Experiments and technologies that are able to capture both the scale and function of chromatin components are are really uh, needed. That's a, that's really a major gap in our field. And the challenge is that um, techniques that can access function are typically expensive, slow, um, require a lot of expertise, um, and, and are, are usually requiring recombinant production of proteins and, and are usually in vitro biochemical assays. Um, and, and it's estimated that about 50% of eukaryotic proteins are going to be difficult to recombinantly produce. So our question was, can synthetic biology approaches um, be used to provide facile, robust access to function at scale. So Allison Waldman is a uh, co-advised student between um, our group and Bala Rao's group in, at NC State. And she created a system called the Rapid Interrogation of Epigenome Modifications on Yeast, what she called uh, coined REMI. Um, so if you enjoy uh, Ratatouille, um, that's REMI right there. And she used the system to ask the question, which histone residues do writers modify? And this is actually a really difficult question to ask, which would involve a lot of protein production and many different biochemical assays to try to get at um, just for one writer. Uh, and one of the reasons for this is that histone residues, uh, histone proteins have many different lysine residues that can be modified, for example, by, uh, by acetylation. So what she did was co-expressed P300, which is a histone acetyltransferase, an enzyme, along with a histone tail, and using uh, endoplasmic reticulum sequestration and targeting uh, peptides, targeted them to the ER, where they, were, they would be in close mutual proximity and be allowed to, um, uh, the enzyme would then be allowed to act on the substrate. And then this uh, histone tail was also fused to an AGA2 yeast surface display uh, protein and displayed on the surface of yeast. And what this allows us to do is then use antibodies to just very easily um, label yeast cells that have acetylation at specific residues. So she tested this out with H3K27, so histone um, H3, the, the 27th lysine, uh, because this is one of the canonical um, residues that is acetylated by, by the P300 enzyme. And shown here um, for a yeast strain that only is expressing the histone H3 tail, you see histone expression here on the y-axis, but you don't see K27 acetylation. If you express the minimal hack domain, the histone acetyltransferase domain of P300, then you get histone expression, but you also see now K27 acetylation that's been catalyzed by the P300 enzyme. And reassuringly, only the yeast cells that are displaying the histone H3 um, tail are also the ones that are uh, displaying the acetylation state. So Allison was like, well, this is pretty robust. It, it's pretty quick. You can do it in, in a day. So she's like, well, why don't we map um, all of the other uh, residues on the, on the internal tail of histone H3 and H4? So this first row is the control where P300 is not expressed. And you can see that none of the sites are acetylated. 
if you express B300, then you see these specific residues that are acetylated. And then she also mutated each of the lysines to arginines to abrogate the ability of B300 to acetylate. And um, in doing so was able to, as expected, knock out um, uh, the acetylation. And actually she um, found that this system is actually really good for testing antibodies um, as well, because we all know how you know, antibodies are so specific, so specific and great. Uh, so, so actually this is a very uh, useful platform to screen antibodies and, and whether they're uh, specific or not. She also um, asked the question, well, if this, the system is, is pretty scalable, um, so can we ask a question that would be uh, pretty challenging to do using bio, in vitro biochemical assays? And, and what she wanted to ask was this question of crosstalk. If one residue is acetylated, how does it affect P300's ability to acetylate another residue on the same histone tail? Um, and so this plot over here is maybe a little easier to see because it's, it's kind of square, but she mutated each of the lysines indiv individually. And then um, and as expected, the acetylation was knocked out for each of these, uh, for each of these conditions. And then she also measured the acetylation levels at all other positions on the histone. And what she found was that there was an interesting um, effect where if you mutate H3K4, uh, if, you, if you mutate the 20th lysine on H4, you also knock out P300's ability to acetylate K8 as well as K16. So these types of interesting crosstalk effects are accessible because of the, the scalability of, of the system. And we're really excited to be able to um, pursue scaling the system uh, further to you know, more, more crosstalk interactions, more uh, different enzymes. So I'm gonna um, do a quick shift now to um, think about not, not biochemical identity. So, so clearly chromatin is biochemically very diverse, but even for just one biochemical, uh, bio, biochemical molecule, so maybe a transcription factor, there can actually be quite a bit of information just contained in that one, one uh, molecule. So for example, transcription factors are known to dynamically bind genes um, and they can bind in, in many dynamic patterns. So these are just three examples. You can bind in, in a high concentration, um, but, but infrequent pulses or, uh, or in a more sustained but low concentration um, pattern. And all of these have the same total input. But the question is, uh, but so they can bind in the same total input, but actually have, they actually contain information in the dynamics. So the question is, are genes actually able to interpret this and yield different outputs based on just the dynamics. So there's reason to believe that this might actually be relevant um, in a natural system as well, because transcription factors in mammalian cells as well as in yeast are known to oscillate um, on the minute time scale. So the question is, are genes able to interpret the information contained in, this, in these dynamic patterns? So to ask this question, um, Jessica Lee, who just graduated and um, a great student, if, if you're, she's on job market now, so if you're interested uh, in working with her, just uh, email me or, or her. So she, she said, well, why don't we use mutual information, information theory to think about this problem? So the idea here is that there are many input signals that are possible. And the question is, can a gene interpret these different input signals into distinct outputs? So, so um, these are kind of mimicking flow cytometry plots where you might have uh, outputs where the cell is expressing a reporter gene at different levels. Um, or is that gene not going to be really able to do that and lead to kind of overlapping populations that you can't really distinguish? So in order to really test this question and, and just ask the question of how much information can a gene transmit, she created an optogenetic system where blue light would dynamically recruit VP16 to a zinc finger uh, fusion protein upstream of a M-cherry reporter. She created a programmable LED matrix um, and programmed it to uh, input light patterns, um, about 119 different light patterns. I mean, so those 119 uh, different light patterns are shown here with different pulse widths, frequency, amplitudes, um, and the full change in the reporters on the y-axis and the frequency amplitude or the total um, light signal, integrated light signals um, shown on the x-axis of these three columns. So I'm not gonna go through all the data, but there's a reason why she, she did this many light conditions. And it was, it was because you need to, the, the potential parameter space is so large. You can have 
continuous uh, range of frequencies, pulse widths, amplitudes, and it's a very large space to explore. Um, and so, but with this 119 light conditions, she was able to kind of capture that large parameter space. Um, and by randomly sampling uh, increasing number of, of those inputs, um, she was able to calculate MI and find that it plateaued at around 1.7 bits. And so this is actually a, a direct calculation of how much information transmission capacity a single gene, single eukaryotic gene is capable of. This might seem kind of low, but actually if you, if uh, most gene expression systems are linked to uh, other regulatory uh, networks that, um, that can uh, confer robustness to, to the response, but also this is also error-free transmission and, and uh, biological systems don't need to have perfect error-free transmission in order to function. So she also finally asked, can the epigenome tune uh, the mutual information content uh, or transmission capacity of the gene? And so um, using the same system, but now also directly recruiting chromatin regulators. So she recruited about a hundred different chromatin regulators um, upstream of the reporter and asked how that affected uh, mutual information. And, and many of these uh, chromatin regulators were able to operate, uh, increase mutual information as well as decrease it. Um, and they were also able to, some of them were able to um, confer interesting signal filtering properties. So for example, um, only activating the gene at low frequency signals, but not at medium and high uh, frequency signals. Okay, so with that, um, in the interest of time, um, again, for this part of the talk, if there's one thing that I, I just wanted to convey is that eukaryotic gene expression is really complex, but we believe it can be de deconstructed with synthetic biology platforms. And I, I really think synthetic biology has a lot to contribute to the field of chromatin biology. And we've shown that you can create platforms to directly map epigenome editor function, um, quantify the information transmission capacity of genes. Um, and then finally, for just in general, if you know, none of this made any sense. And um, the one thing that I, I'd like you to just uh, be able to take away is that Poppy did not know how much information she contained or that synthetic biology could help her access so much of it. Um, so with that, I, I just really wanna acknowledge uh, most importantly, the students in, in my group. Um, they have, uh, their, their dedication and hard work have been um, you know, uh, really inspirational and um, especially over the past two years, they really banded together, helped each other out, supported each other, um, and have really made my career a very fulfilling choice um, to have pursued. Uh, so I hope their you know, PhDs are similarly fulfilling to them. Um, thank our funding support. Um, really appreciate you know, the NIH and IBIB and the NSF um, really pushing uh, synthetic biology. Um, and, uh, and of course, thank our collab longtime collaborators, James Tuck and Bala Rao that have helped with this work. Um, so with that, uh, I just wanna say I'm really excited to, to uh, meet and learn about all the other work that is going on in the community um, through the seminar series. And thanks again, TakeSock for um, the invitation to present. Thank you, Albert. I mean, fantastic talk. I really enjoyed that. So also thank you all, I mean, audience, I mean, you know, sticking around. I believe this is now 11 in my time. And then I know, I mean, many friend actually colleague actually said, Oh, I cannot join because I mean the class started and you know AC, ACS kind of attending and actually I attended ACS myself in the morning today and then I came back I mean for this one. So I mean although in the conflict, but you know you guys kind of still stick around and thank you so much. So if you have any question, just you know you know type in I mean the Q and A and then I will start with the one question I have here from Travis. So I'll read you know, for you, a uh, very good talk, Albert. My question is regarding the use of using PCR to copy data. If data stored in DNA is copied via PCR, what is the error rate in copying 10 to the 17 pieces of DNA? Wow, a lot. Uh, would multiple single and eucaryotide mutations on a single DNA strand in this DNA population have impacts on the data stored in each file? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and and the, the question of just error rates in general is, is a very uh, big problem. So, um, so errors can be addressed on several fronts. So on the encoding side, um, there are methods to uh, imbue some redundancy into systems um, to so, so if you do have errors, you can kind of tell, or you can, um, so, so there's a lot of encoding strategies to, to deal with error rates. And one of the 
things that you know the field really should do is measure what the error rates are for all different processes and then match encoding strategies uh, that can account for that. Um, one of the interesting things about PCR and one of the reasons why you know, maybe our group has kind of been leaning away from using PCR too much is that if you get an error, it kind of locks that error in. Um, so you will have errors through PCR uh, just based on the error rate of, of the polymerase. Um, but the other problem is that it, it kind of locks that in, right? It can amplify that error. Um, and so if you have methods where you can reduce the amount of copying necessary in order to access a file, then that would be really useful. And that's one of the reasons why we kind of like the Doris system where you're transcribing um, the data um, out, of, out of the DNA. So any other question from audience? I, I know, I mean, this is uh, already in a one hour pass. And any question from panelists? So in that case, I'll ask one, you know, quick question. So it, this is amazing. I mean, you know, now we are talking about, you know, you know, memory and everything kind of stored, I mean, in the biological system. So could you, I mean, a little bit, you know, elaborate your vision in terms of the, the fear, I mean, in this direction, I'm, I'm fascinated by, you know, the, our ability, but still there are many, many challenges and, you know, you know, opportunity in this field. So I'm, I'm, I just want to hear from expert like you. Uh, is like, where, where do we see the, where do we see the field going in the next year? Right, 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 right. Um, I mean, the, yeah, there are a lot of challenges, but um, I, I think actually a, a, one of the exciting things is that um, a lot of the processes, I think, are at a stage where we, we just need to automate a lot of things. And um, there's going to be economies of scale to address a lot of the problems that we have. Um, so that includes DNA synthesis, DNA sequencing. I, I don't think that there's any, you know, we thought a lot about this, and I actually don't think that there are fundamental limitations um, to those processes, to scaling those processes to the, to the level that we need in order to make this a reality. Um, there are some things, and the reason we focused on this crowding, molecular crowding uh, issue is that that is kind of a fundamental thermodynamic bottleneck. Um, but I think that we can get past a lot of that. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, there, if you're interested in this field, you know, the DNA Storage Alliance that was um, started by Microsoft, Western Digital, Twist, um, Biosciences, Illumina, um, they've assembled a lot of startup companies um, and, and mature companies as well, uh, academic labs, uh, to think about this. And I think um, there's a growing ecosystem of people thinking about all the different uh, unit processes that, that need to be addressed. Okay, thank you. So any question, audience or all the speakers? I mean, I guess, I mean, you have all other schedule. Oh, go ahead. So since I get the opportunity, so, you know, I love the you know, great, great talk. I really, um, you know, the stuff around chromatin is really fascinating to me. And, you know, I think that, uh, so one of the, things that I've been thinking about in terms of the limitations of what we can do in synthetic biology is our ability to really control what happens in eukaryotes and that and that's possibly limited to, um, by our ability to rationally engineer or you know or control chromatin organization and so what will it take for us to get to that same stage of being able to manipulate chromatin so that we get expression when we want. Um, and will we, you know, do we have the tools? We just haven't figured out yet how to apply them or, you know, what, just what do you think, what, where do you see the limitations and what are the opportunities? Yeah, I, I think that there's, um, I really like the analogy to genetic engineering, right? We have all those tools, restriction enzymes and things to cut DNA, cut and paste DNA. Where are we going to be for, for the epigenome? Can, can we get the same kind of tool set for that? So I, I really think that there's kind of two things that we might need to do. The first is still just characterize and understand the functionality of all of these biochemical components um, and, and the enzymes. We kind of know a lot of what exists and what their identities are, but we don't really understand um, how they're placed or when they're placed or 
Um, and so there's actually just a lot of characterization that we need to do at the functional level. Um, and, and I think synthetic biology really is a great match for that because we love function, we love kind of forward engineering and then looking at a functional outcome. Um, Aside from that, I think a lot of maybe protein engineering would be really useful. Um, and this is uh, great that you know, Dr. Arnold is here because I think um, directed evolution would be a really useful way to create tools that are more specific. Right? So currently most of epigenome engineering is using existing proteins to execute different functions like catalyze the histone modification. Um, but can we use uh, can we use directed evolution or other protein engineering approaches to um, make those more specific or view new functions um, to the control of, of, of chromatin? So, uh, yeah, I think it, you know, it, it just really matches well with, with synthetic biology, I feel. Great, thank you. Any other question? Actually, I see one question from Rosanna. So when do you think DNA storage will see widespread use? Does anyone use it in a practical today today? Yeah, so this is a this is a tough question to ask, you know, because we were thinking about um, you know when when the first computer came about and what did people think then, right? Um, when it was a computer that that you know, it could only calculate a few calculations uh, in a day. How did people really think that was going to scale? If you think about the first transistor, the first transistor, the, the Britain or Bartain um, transistor is massive, right? And that's just one transistor. So it's hard to predict, but I think maybe even five years um, down the road, we might actually have some archival systems using DNA. Um, 10 years, maybe we have some systems that not only are archival, but can also do some computation as well. Uh, so, so there's some you know, DNA computing field is actually older than the storage field. Um, and there's a lot of benefits there. Um, currently there are, uh, there was a group in Europe that stored a music video for a band. Um, so that was kind of like one of the cu first customers. Uh, I think there's a lot of archive, archival applications that this would be great for. Uh, so yeah, I mean, I, I think that there are, there are probably gonna be some niche um, products coming out, but that will grow and grow and, and uh, hopefully, you know, make these, encourage these systems to become more and more functional. That, that's fantastic, you know, answer. So I also remember, you know, I kind of, you know, grow up, I mean, you know, entire computer, you know, evolution, I mean, or, and then I still remember, you know, when I was college in a senior year, I finally saved enough money to buy my own computer. <laughs> and and then the, the entire hard drive was two giga. And the half of that is just, you know, the cellular based screen was in in store. I mean, all the video game at the time. And then and then I kind of addicted to that. And then I, oh, I realized I need to stop, you know, playing this game. And then I just delete all of that. And then pre up, I mean, you know, one giga. But we are not now talking about you know, much, much more, you know, storage I mean, capacity in computer science. But now we are talking about the DNA, you know, storage. And that's fascinating, fascinating. Thank you so much. So probably uh, we uh, have, you know, we probably want, you know, all the, you know, speakers, I you know, just, you know, do another job. I mean, you know, daily job. So we will have, you know, further discussion. Uh, I actually posted, you know, the, another Zoom link that's smaller group. In that, you know, in a smaller group, we could chat, I mean, you know, basically uh, with the, your voice and then your face. I mean, and then, you know, Albert, I mean, you know, you know, willing to you know chat more so please join and click that one and then we'll you know see you there and then i also want to thank all the speakers today and this was you know uh you know mean a lot i mean to me and to young speak in the young people in the audience and also as i said earlier you know we have the another conference going on right now acs conference and many of the my colleagues actually need to go there for chatting also speaking and some other duty there and I actually went there, I mean, and then came back here and also class started, but still, you know, many people, is, you know, stick around right now. So I'm really appreciate all your, you know, excitement and I'm happy to see you all uh, in the next one that is uh, again, uh, Thursday, the same time. And thank you so much. And, and I see you in uh, another Zoom link. Thank you so much. 
Hey, so should I also go to that Zoom link? Or? Right, right. If you have time, and I believe you have time until uh, you know, eleven something, yeah. right? Yeah. Okay. Thank you, all of you, and thank you. I mean, you know, Teresa, India, Francis, and Doug, and I, I really appreciate it. And then thank you, Tony. I mean, you know, without you, I mean, we cannot do anything. Yeah, this is my, you know, Iron Man, by the way. And he's, by the way, I mean, by any chance, the name is Tony, so Iron Man. Okay, so see you in another Zoom meeting. So thank you so much. I mean, Tony, you don't need to be there because I could handle that Zoom on, you know, without any help. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you. Bye-bye now. Bye-bye now.